Hi, my name is Lucas, and I serve as one of the pastors on staff at Bayview Glen Church in Thornhill. One of the issues that's facing our church today, and really the global church, is this topic of race and racism. Now, a couple weeks ago, we made a statement that we are anti-racism, but the reality is a statement like that just isn't enough. We need to continue this conversation. And for me, one of the ways that I need to continue and grow in my journey is by seeking to understand. I will never see the world through the eyes of a black man in North America. I won't, although I am raising one. And so in an effort to see the world through the eyes of a black man in North America to help me be a better dad, to help me be a better pastor, to help me be a better Christian, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, I took an opportunity to interview a friend just a couple weeks ago, and I wanted to share that interview with you. It was so enlightening for me, and I hope it is enlightening for you as well. My friend's name is Lawrence. Uh, he was born here in Toronto. He lives in Manhattan now. And this uh, whole topic of racism has impacted him in a deep way. And I just wanted to understand just a little bit more the world from his eyes. I hope you are as blessed by his thoughts as I was. Please enjoy. Did you watch the George Floyd video? I did. So um, I watched the video in its entirety. Uh, so that was Memorial Day. It's crazy. You know, the minute you ask that, it immediately triggers emotions. And I watched the video uh, in its entirety uh, the day after Memorial Day um, here. And it, I was overcome, just as I'm about to get overcome with emotions now. Um, I did watch it, yeah. Uh, what, what are the primary emotions that you felt? There's so many things there uh, when I watched that video. One of the, one of the things that, the, the, the first reaction, I, I, if, I, if I go back to that time, the first reaction was, oh my God, get off this guy's neck. Right. Right. And, and, you know, Luke, one of the things that as I sit here now and talk about it, what I think is very potent is how calm the, uh, the police officer looked, how calm uh, Chauvin looked. It was like nothing. It was like nothing. Um, hands in his pockets. So the casualness, the casualness of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it one of the things that, that, that stands out is, is you're, you're kneeling on a man's neck and as he was looking at the woman uh, who was filming it, uh, uh, she, you know, she's been out there now and a lot of people are trying to make sure that we support her because it was a very traumatic thing for her. But as he was looking at um, the woman and the man who were there trying to talk to him, he's it's casual. It would be as if my hands in my pocket, it's now as if I'm just whistling in the wind. This is not something to be casual about. So what, what, what stands out to me is the ease, the ease. And that's, that's what's alarming. That's what's dangerous, is the ease in which you could take someone's life. Are we saying that he intended to kill the man in that moment? Oh no, he's been charged with murder. But you certainly had no regard for, for uh, his inability to breathe. And you certainly had no regard for these people pleading with you to get off his neck. Mm -hmm. So my initial thoughts uh, are, hey, get off his neck. My initial, uh, and then there's sadness and there's anger. And then there's fear in like, wow, this is how easy it is. This is how easy it is. And whenever we get to a place where things become really easy, that's a dangerous thing. Where we come to a place where killing or, 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 or any crime especially a violent crime becomes easy. That's a very dangerous and scary thing. It's a very scary thing because then we stop seeing people as human. And that, that to me is where the fear is. So you, you mentioned fear. And so one of my other questions is, um, and, and it, I'm, I think I'm leading the witness here a little bit, but, <laughs> but uh, have you ever felt fear when you've been pulled over and or addressed by police or you see a police car or whatever that, that you think stems from the color of your skin? So that's a great question. You're not leading. 
at all. Um, it's, a, it's a very fair question. You know, what's interesting is within the black community, well, first of all, within humans in general, we have so many different experiences, right? From shades of our skin to gender to so many different things. But within the black community, there is a, there's such a large spectrum, right? As there are within the white community, whether it's Irish, Italian, Jewish, whatever, right? But within yeah. this, I'll speak. Te Texans. Right? Texas. Texas, right? Yeah. <laughs> like y'all, your own community there, right? That's right. It's still the greatest country in the world, man. Still yeah, the greatest exactly. country in the world. Exactly. Yeah. In your mind. And so, <laughs> but, the, the, but being part of the black community, but the spectrum to me is so interesting. I, I love it. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. But that spectrum is, is wide in that I can speak to it from my experience as a black man living in the States who's not American. I'm coming at it from a Canadian perspective. I'm an immigrant here. And so my experiences are different in Canada. My experiences are different in the States. Mm -hmm. Two different things. They are, they are night and day mm -hmm. to an extent. My experiences in Canada with police, for the most part, have been exemplary. And that's why I said that spectrum is so, is so broad because I'm in a privileged position, and I can admit that, in that when I've been interacted with cops, in Canada, it's been 90%, if not more, pleasant. It's have there been racial profiling? Without a doubt. I've definitely been pulled over for DWB, those who don't know, driving while black. <laughs> and I um and I remember I remember being pulled over and my car apparently fit the description. You know, he's okay, can that happen? Sure. Um by the end of the conversation, I ended up giving the cop an autograph. I was coming back from a, uh, from a film set and we had just wrapped and he ended up talking to me about him wanting to be an actor and blah, blah, blah. But that ended up being a positive experience. Mm -hmm. And there have been many more positive experiences that stemmed from something that could not have been. You know, I was a teen being pulled over. I, didn't pull, I wasn't pulled over. I was sitting at a bus stop, waiting for the bus, uh, dropping my girlfriend off at the time, my high school girlfriend, and cops were like, what are you doing here? And my mother loves telling this story because I look around, I'm like, it's a bus stop. <laughs> uh, I was like, but, I'm, but you know me well enough to know. I said, but I'm really glad you're here because it is dark and I am somewhat terrified. So if you can hang out here until the bus comes, that would be great and keep me company. So my experiences for the most part have been good. However, I have definitely experienced fear in the States. And that's an interesting thing for me to even say, admit fear. It's not something that I readily admit. But I'm aware, and I'm aware driving in the South. I remember driving through Louisiana, getting pulled over by a state trooper. Um, and I did not feel as much fear because he was black. Had he been a white state trooper, maybe a different situation. Mm -hmm. um, but most recently, I can tell you the answer is yes. And it's not a, not a feeling I've felt, I felt in years. That uh, being pulled over in the South was like in 2010. I've been pulled over in New York here. And the cop said to me uh, on the bridge, on the Triborough, he said, I just want to take the time. This was like two years ago. So I just want to take the time to say, I appreciate how respectful you are and, uh, you know, just how polite you are. And oftentimes, you know, we don't get that kind of reaction. Uh, he didn't know I was Canadian. So that's probably, probably what it is. So my privileged position is that's how I approach most things. I approach most things with how, you know, the energy that I'm putting out oftentimes going to be the energy that gets put back. That's not always the case. That's just my experience. Mm -hmm. But I do know that I felt fear for the first time in years. Um, the day after I watched the George Floyd video, I've been taking night rides in Central Park. And sometimes I go at nine o'clock uh, during COVID. Sometimes I go at 10. I've gone sometimes at 11 p.m. Now, you might say, that's a little late to go ride in the park. Maybe. Uh, but I did not have any concerns with it. I'm 6'1", big black guy. I'm not really worried about being in Central Park at night. Uh, I don't, I, that's not a fear that I have. Mm -hmm. But for the first time in years, the day after I watched that video, as I was coming up to the, um, the back half of my lap, that I do, I do three laps, and there was a police cruiser behind me. Uh, there's been a strong presence of police in the, in the park, which has been great um, for safety. But there was a cruiser behind me. And dude, for the first time in years, I was like, wow, like 
something could happen right now in this park and there's no one around to film it. There's no one around to make sure that I'm okay. Mm-hmm. And there's no one around to say that I didn't do anything wrong. And that was, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, wow. And now, same thing. I, I will not go, I'm, I'm certainly much more hesitant to go out riding at night, mm-hmm. um, especially with everything that's happening. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the, the interesting parts of this conversation is that I was born in the Southern United States that has a little bit of a reputation when it comes to the particular issue that we're talking about today. And now, I have, to, <laughs> and now I have two black children and I'm living in the most multi-ethnic city in the world. You were born where? Toronto. And now you're living in New York. So we kind of have these yeah. interesting experiences. And so one of the things that I would love it if you would speak to is, is I think my impression has been for a lot of Canadians is that this is an American problem. And the further south, <laughs> the further south you go, the worse it gets. Perhaps that's true. The further south you go, the worse it gets. Perhaps that's true. But, but, would you just speak to that kind of like this is an American problem kind of uh, notion? Yeah. You know, Luke, it's, it's so funny how these things come up because as I'm talking to you now, like it's an emotional convo. It's an emotional conversation. And uh, I mean, I wear my heart on my sleeve, so I have no issue with that. But it, um, I didn't expect these, these things to get, uh, to get uh, so stirred up. These emotions get so stirred up. Um, they are because being from Canada, we love to take that position. We love to take that position of, hey, we are multicultural. We are accepting of everyone. We are inclusive. We're diverse. We use all these words. We embrace, um, you know, we're tolerant. And right, I would say all those favorite. things it, it are true in large part, right? In large, in large part, in true. large part. Though. But in to large get part, to true. that, like we, therefore, we don't have an issue. And that's yeah, and, and that that's where that's where the, that's where I kind of jump in, where I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I wrote, I remember writing an essay about this years ago when I was in school, and it was just like Canadian racism, or Canadian issues of discrimination exist. They're just different than than American ways of racism and where American ways of discrimination. And I think you hit it on the head. Once you get into the, well, we're tolerant, we're embracing, we do all this, therefore we can't. That's a dangerous thing because, you know, you, you really start getting a little too comfortable. And that, that's like, you know, that's like someone who's, who, who maybe is verbally abusive to their spouse. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't beat my spouse. You know, I'm not, I'm not violent with my spouse, Mm -hmm. you know, at least I'm not like that guy. Right. And that's a danger. That's a dangerous thing because both things are wrong. We're really talking about our degrees and we're really talking about, you know, psychological. We, we know that verbal abuse carries psychological wounds. Physical wounds often can heal verbal don't. And the reason I'm actually, and I think it's actually a really good analogy because I would equate it between Canada and the U S Canada does not have the violent crime issue um, that the States has, does not have the, certainly not the, 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 the degree to which we have violent racist acts or violent police brutality. We definitely have it. Gun culture. But gun culture is different. The gun, the gun culture is different. All that is different. Our history of slavery is not there where it is with the States. So there are different things. But the reason I think this verbal abuse and physical abuse parallel works is because the key word in both of those things is abuse, right? And the same thing happens with Canada and the U.S. It's, okay, we may not have the, the lynch, the history of lynchings. We may not have these things. What we do have is structural racism. What we do have is systemic racism. What we do have is, you know, we don't speak about these things. We don't speak about corporate culture in Canada. Right. And, you know, we love to, to think we're pretty multicultural, and we certainly are, for, by and large. But once you leave Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal, Canada pretty white. <laughs> pretty white. Yeah. And I've traveled across the country. And that's not a bad thing. But it, it we we get too comfortable. And we love to and listen. 
I, I, no matter where I go, I'm always Canadian. I'll travel across the globe. I travel across the globe, but wherever I am, I am Canadian. Um, and we definitely have a mentality of, uh, we're not as crazy as those Americans. We're not as uncivilized as those Americans. Yeah. And that probably comes from our association with England and the Queen and, and, and that kind of history. Like in the last seven years since I've been, you know, when I've traveled internationally, people ask me where I'm from. I, I don't say I was born in New Mexico. I lived in Texas. I don't say I lived in Arizona for a long time. I say I, I live in Canada. I mean, I can't say I'm Canadian, but I do say I live in Toronto uh, because it just, it for whatever reason, it's just feels more benign. But then when we mentally kind of get to that point where now we're turning a blind eye, right, to what could be going on, what is going on. And, you know, for me, we, we talk about this, uh, and I, I've said this a hundred times at Bayview, nobody wins in the comparison game. So the minute you start to compare, if I'm, at least I'm not that way, or at least I'm better than that person or whatever, better than that person, better than that company, better than that country, better than that family, whatever, then, then we excuse ourselves from whatever might be going on with us, right? Um, what, one of the I things- think you're absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. And, and just to touch on that, I think you're absolutely yeah, right. And, and what, what that leads to then is, is you, put your, you put your guard up, you put your defense mechanisms up, right? And then you're like, well, I'm not that, so I can excuse behavior, or I don't even need to take a look at it, as you said, as a blind eye. Right. And I, I think with, you know, and this is not to say, as you said, by and large, we are. I, I, I tear up when I think about Canada. I tear up because I love our country. I love Canadians. I love what we stand for. I love who we are as a group. But just because we, we do some things well, it doesn't mean, hey, we're not doing something. You know, that's not, doesn't say you're bad. It just means, oh, hey, you know what? We could probably do this a little better. We yeah. could probably maybe enhance this. Just because you have strengths, it does not mean that you don't have areas of improvement. Right. We were talking about this, I don't know, uh, a, f a few days ago, a few nights ago, whatever it was, and we talked, um, that I think when we use the word racism, uh, many people think um, about racial slurs. Yeah. Um, but especially in the, um, uh, you know, in American Sun, like one of the things they address there is there is some coded language that, that has racist undertones or, or overtones or whatever. Could, do you have a couple of examples that come to mind of like coded language or, or questions you've been asked or comments that you're going, hmm, that doesn't, that you may, you may not have just called me a name, but but by what you said, there's there's your there's some racism happening here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm loquacious, so I'll try and get to the point quickly. But I, I actually referenced you the other day. I referenced something you said the other day, and I think um, this is maybe the surface before I get a little deeper. But you said something that 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 I use, and it was our perceptions of reality are not necessarily reality. And you talked about being alone versus lonely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> right? And so yeah, I listen when you talk. And you um and, and it's true because you might feel lonely. And that's a that's a valid feeling. That is an important feeling. That is a feeling that needs to be respected and, and, and understood and catered to, but that does not mean you're alone. Right? Because you might you have family, you have friends, you have people around you, but that feeling you know, and often, unfortunately, sometimes we make that feeling the reality, not the case. And I say that because um, sometimes there isn't necessarily an intent. Someone says something, maybe there isn't, you know, the, the intent to do something or, 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 or offend, but subconsciously, the rea it, it then becomes reality. So I guess what I'm leading to is we feel comfortable that gets back into the, well, I didn't say the N-word. I didn't say this. I didn't say that. And unfortunately, we've gone into a place where, um, where we've got the, a very binary thing. It's either, it's either racism looks like a clan, uh, a hooded sheet, the N-word, or, uh, or a killing or a lynching or cross burning. These really visceral violent yeah. um you know images it doesn't have to be like that racism can also look like why 
when you interviewed two people that were both qualified for the job and you went with someone who was uh, who was not a person of color, someone who was not black, out of preference. Racism can look like maybe the black person was more qualified than they get the job. Racism also looks like or sounds like, you know, when I say to someone, you know, we love asking people where they're from. It's such a big question, right? Because mm-hmm. we, we love to kind of put people in boxes. You know, and I tell everyone, oh, I'm from Canada. But no, where are you really from? Uh, right? Okay. All right, where are you really from? Yeah. I'm talking about, I was born at Mount Sinai Hospital, University Avenue. What are you talking about? <laughs> right? And so, right, what, what that gets into that, because it, it really, we're trying to put people in the tribes, really, and, right? And I think, we, you know, that's a coded thing. Or, you know, words like ghetto. Oh, that's so ghetto. Or that's so this. That's so urban, right? Urban's a great word we use all the time. Well, really, we want to say black. Oh, that's urban music. But country music, urban music? What are you talking about? It's urban music. Right, right. Like, what, what are you talking about? So it's these languages and these codes, right, that, that, that you know, that, that we have to think about. And I particularly address this when I, when I get to black women. Because we, society loves to use coded language when it gets to black women. And, you know, racism doesn't have to be calling a black woman the N-word or whatever. But it might also look like, um, you know, Tiffany Haddish talked about this, the actress talked about this, where she would go to auditions and then she would overhear or she or she overheard or was made aware to her through a tape or, or leaked audio, um, I think an email that they talked about her when she left the room, like, oh my God, she's so ghetto, she's so this. Hmm. That's coded, right? That's, that's, I mean, that's barely coded. That's almost as, yeah. you know, that, that's clear. But the word that, 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 I, that I can't stand to hear that, we, that, that gets used when we talk about black women is, aggressive and you hear this very often you hear this very often particularly um particularly from in white institutions or white corporate world a lot of my black sisters have told me they get told you're so aggressive or i felt threatened and it's and we only use that in fact we only use that for black men and women i felt threatened what do we always hear when we hear police talk i felt threatened my life was at risk which then led to justification to, to kneel on his neck or, 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 or overly, you know, police. We hear that word all the time, but that's a violent act. We get to the coded language when it comes to black women or, or, or even black men in, in corporate, but particularly for black women, you're so aggressive, you're so this. And it's like, no, it's, it's not aggression. It's, it's, you know, unfortunately, when you don't have your voice respected for, for very often or your voice is not heard, you sometimes have to be a little bit louder, right? And, you know, what's that saying? Squeaky wheels gets the oil, gets the oil right? Mm-hmm. And so when, when your voice, and this is just women in general, women are constantly told not to be loud. And you, you have a daughter. <clears throat> and we constantly, society is constantly telling women, be demure, be meek, don't be too loud. You know, let, you know, let men go first or, or you know, don't, don't, don't cause any trouble. That's just with women in general. Now, when we get to black women, we hear that all the time. It's, you know, why do you have to be so loud? I've heard this so many times. Um, uh, you know, white men will, I, I've heard within the circle say, you know, I won't date black women. And I'll say, why not? Because everyone's got a preference. That's fine. But why not? Wow, so aggressive, so loud. And I'm like, I don't really find that. Hmm. Right. But I think what you're mistaking for passion, what you're mistaking for your voice needing to be heard is aggressive. But that's just coded language we use with women in general, you know? Yeah. One of the, one of the things that, that I've heard multiple times, which is very interesting, is um, the, the statement, well, you don't sound black. You don't talk, oh, yeah. you don't talk black, which is very interesting because it, it, it can work the other way. So um, when Amy will call and make an appointment for Kaya to get her hair done, they can't see Amy's face, right? So they don't know. And so she calls and she says, uh, I've got a daughter. I want to bring her in, get her hair done. And sometimes, and, and, you know, for Kaya's hairstyle, you want to go to a particular type of salon with a particular type of skill set. You know, you don't just bring her into a super cuts. So, um, so just she'll say it. you got to go to a black salon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Black salon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, so she'll call, 
and and sometimes you know people you can hear them on the other line and you can hear their confusion in their voice and then there's been a couple times where somebody will go are you sure you're calling the right place because amy doesn't sound black right and there so it, it can work both ways and i think that's coded language one of the things that i'm guilty of and i may not put this on the on the thing so so i don't announce this to the world but uh you know I'll, you know you can't tell because you're sitting but you are a a large black man so my assumption is you played football yeah yeah did you yeah no I did it. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's I mean, so funny because I hear it all the time. Yeah, and I know that like what like what your career is now. The likelihood is in high school you spent most of your time doing what? Reading, filming. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I, and, yeah. And and it and it's all big, and and some again it, that's the blind eye piece, and we just move past that real quick, and then if we would rewind and go, why did I make that assumption? Right. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's got something to do with your stature as a man, but it's, it's also got something to do with your skin color. And, and, and frankly, there's, well, without some, a doubt. there's some funky stuff. And that's, that's even me. Right. And I got black, I got black kids. I can tell myself I'm not a racist, but then I, I, those assumptions happen and you're going, Oh, yuck. Well, that's not, but I don't know how much of a yuck it is. Right. Is like, I, th I think it's cool that we, I think it's awesome that we, I love this because we we'll get real here. I think it's awesome that we that we we check ourselves. I think we all need to check ourselves, black yeah. and white. And I know we'll yeah. touch on that, but we all need to maybe be like, oh wait, why did I think that? But I don't know. I, I wonder how much of that is us or how much of what is fed to us, right? I'm a big believer in because I've studied media and that and that's my world. I'm a big believer in the images that we see. We end up often taking as what they should be, right? And life has a way of imitating art, just as art imitates <laughs> life. So. If we grow up with a history of seeing every president look a certain way, every president being an old white man, we start thinking, oh, presidents. We don't see women. We don't see black men as presidents. Freezing? You good? You got me? Yeah, you're you're back now. You froze for a minute. You're back. Okay, I'll just. I heard it. I heard the audio, but you're you you. Okay. So yeah. you see so, every, every president's an old white man. Yeah, if you see every president as an old white man, what then, that then ends up reinforcing what our belief systems are. We end up being like, oh, wait, all presidents should be old white men. We can't have a woman. We can't have an Asian president. We can't have a black president. You know what I mean? So, I, I, you know, or if we see football players and they're black, we naturally start thinking, oh, black people play football. We see bankers and they're white. Oh, white people are bankers. So a lot of that, I think, is less us and less just the images that are then portrayed or, or reinforced, and then we start like thinking about it. And the reason I, I know this for a fact, I suppose, is do you remember the show 24? Yeah. Okay, keep your soul in. Love the show. And that to me was the first time that I, I mean, that I remember. Um, there was probably other examples, but we had, there was a black president. David Palmer was the president and on that show, uh, played by Dennis Haysbert. And I remember being like, oh, great voice, better voice than mine, which is tough for me to say. But <laughs> Dennis Haysbert was the president. And this was pre Obama, this was the Bush years. Mm. So I was like, oh, wow, there's a black president. And everyone just kind of accepted that that president, like that became the template. And I genuinely believe that that had a, a, a part to play in people being comfortable with seeing Obama as president because the template was there. Life imitated art. Yeah. 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 Life imitated art. And same, yeah. and that's why the Cosby show was so important or Fresh Prince was so important. We'll right. use Fresh Prince as a much better, less toxic example. But yeah. Fresh Prince was a better, was, was great because people are like, oh wait, that's a black family living in Bel Air. And you had a whole spectrum. You had Will who was a little, who was not bougie. You had Hillary who was super bougie. You had Carlton. Yeah. So and Uncle Phil, how, Uncle Phil was a judge, a right? Uncle Phil was a judge. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I think I think too. One of the things that you're pointing out here that I think is really helpful is that sometimes I think we conclude, or or you know, in our minds, like, what what is it that I can really do? In your case, I'm an actor. What is it that I can really do? Well, you can. 
in every area of life, no matter what your vocation is, no matter what your hobbies are, no matter what your lifestyle is, no matter how diverse or not diverse the community you live in is, no matter what, like in this particular case, you're just pointing out that the fresh Prince of Bel Air, for crying out loud, had an impact on the way that we see color. That's pretty cool. That tells me that it doesn't matter who you are, you can do something. Yes. Yeah. Without a doubt. And I think it comes to small sets. I think sometimes we think it has to be some major thing or right. some major act. And that's why I, I love that we use this example of, you know, what it's like in Canada versus what it's like in the U S you have two different approaches, two different histories, two different experiences, but there is always something you can do for me. What I'm doing with, with our show late night in Harlem is that's a great way to highlight, you know, perspectives from, a person who looks like me. That's a great way to highlight perspectives from uh, you know, a woman who looks like one of my correspondents, Bree, is I, genuinely, I know the impact of media, just like I know the impact of sports, but all these things play a role, to, to your point. It's not one thing. It's, you know, it's not just protesting. It's not just policy change. It's not just donating money. It's you know, what you said. How much am I really stepping back and thinking, wait, why did I think that? Why did I ask that question? Right. Why, why did I ask, did you play football? Yeah. Or why did I ask? Because, because we tend to go into, we, we put people in the boxes. And oftentimes when you see, when you see uh, a black male, right, you see a black guy and you think it's going to be either entertainment or athletics. And these are the boxes that, that we've been put in. And these are the biases that we have to kind of undo. Right? So one of the things you're saying here that I, is helpful for me personally is that if I assume that you played football, um, that might not be a yuck, but it might just be a, you just want to be able to put your finger on it and say, I made this assumption for this reason. And I don't have to wear that guilt and shame, but to identify that I, that I made an assumption and, and just to be able to put my finger on it is a helpful place to be. I think so. Because what I don't want, Luke, is I don't want us to get to a place, brother, where we start Guilt and shame is a powerful thing, right? It's a very, these are powerful things. And I don't want us to get to a place where, where we start operating from a place of, uh, of too much guilt or too much shame because these can bog us down. And then they can make us afraid to do anything, right? It becomes paralysis by overanalysis, right? right? And it's like, oh, why did I think that? I'm a bad person. Oh my gosh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm not going to say anything head down. That's not the way to do it. Right. I think maybe it's a, oh, that was weird. Why did I think that? Yeah. Re-examine. It's like, oh, okay. That was clearly I have a bias. Don't have a bias. So yeah. How's that, right? Well, that I think one of the places that that guilt and shame maybe has played itself out, and this this is leading to a question here, is especially in language. So if I saw you on the streets of New York, I would say, um, you know, uh, look over there at at that guy in that t-shirt with that hat on the African-American man. It, well, the interesting part is you're neither African nor American, right? And so I think we, we kind of posture and, and, you know, try like, and especially in language, like, like it's okay to say black, right? Yeah. It's not a bad word. Yeah. It's not a bad, <laughs> yeah. It's not a bad, it's not, it's not a bad word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, and, and I think, in, in that, you know, that, that word politically correct is a charged word right now. And I think so for so many people, there's a desire to be sensitive. And I think that's yeah. good, right? To, to monitor their language and to use the terms that are most helpful, even in adoption, right? People ask us questions and they'll ask questions about like, well, do you know her mom? And I'll respond with, yes, we know her birth mom. Her mom is standing right here. But we know her yeah. birth mom, and it's just it's just a it's just a a little it's just a little tweak in language to help us grow and understand. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and I even think you know sitting here and saying it's okay to say black. Like th I think for a lot of people because it, there's a it's not it's just a desire to be sensitive, right? And a desire to honor people as people who are made in the image of God. Right. But but then to have and then we, we don't have open, honest conversations because that guilt and shame squeezes us. Right. It squeezes us yes. instead of instead of having the opportunity to ask questions. Right. Make mistakes. 
make, I, th I, I think if you make mistakes, first of all, we're all gonna make mistakes. None of us are perfect. We have not created perfect. That's not how we live. And you know, in the startup world, you know, they say perfect is the enemy of good. And I think that's something to keep in mind, we cannot be perfect. We can have a quest to be perfect. And I think that's where the perfection lies in, is in trying to get there. Make mistakes. But I think if you're making mistakes from a place of honesty and integrity, then you'll always be, for the most part, okay, right? And I don't think it's a, it's not bad to say, oh, who, uh, he's a black guy, or he's a white guy, he's a white girl, he's a black girl, he's a, but I do think it's, it's understanding the why. You know, like, so you got, you got back to code and language before, like, why was, so why was that necessary? And that's where I think sometimes it comes into play. Mm -hmm. It's a different story if it's like, okay, you know, um, describe him for me, you know? What does he look like? Or what does she look like? You know, if it's relevant to the conversation, like if I would, if someone would be like, hey, you know, who's Lucas? Describe him for me. Oh, looking guy, not that tall, right? Wearing a hat, you know, white guy. That's it. Like, the, like there's, not, there's, no, there's no ill intent there. Yeah. I think though, once we, my, my ears always perk up is once we add qualifiers in situations that qualifiers don't necessarily need to be added, mm. you know? But, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like yeah, I picture somebody watching this call after the fact and <clears throat> they're sitting there on their computer watching the call and somebody asks them, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm watching this conversation between Lucas and Lawrence. And, and then someone says, well, which one is Lucas and which one is Lawrence? It's OK to say <laughs> Lawrence is wearing a white shirt and Lucas is wearing a maroon hoodie. That's how you tell them apart. That's how you tell them. Like, just say black guy, white guy. Yeah. I mean, that's. That's okay. Okay, so um, yeah, here's and it also pertains to the conversation, though, right? Like it's a black guy and white guy having a convo about race. I think that makes a difference. That's an important thing. That's an right. Important, right. important thing to describe the conversation that we're having because it adds to the importance. So what I would suggest is maybe think about it for everyone. Think about how much it adds to the conversation. If it's necessary, great. If it's not, why bring it up? Yeah. Okay, so here's one. Do you prefer Black Lives Matter or All Lives Matter, and why? That's the critical one. So uh, that's an easy question. That's an easy question. All Lives Matter is nonsense. Not that, not that all lives don't matter, because we know, first of all, we know lives matter. We know that. We know that life matters. We know, like, there's a word for people who don't believe that lives matter. They're psychopaths, right? Mm -hmm. they're, 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 if you don't believe that life matters, we usually put you in an institution. That's kind of the way it goes. So let's, under the, let's, let's work under the assumption and, and observation that most of us are not psychopaths or sociopaths, mm -hmm. and, we all, and we, all of us, we human, believe that life matters and all human lives matter. Okay, start so at that assumption. That's great. Let, let's start at that assumption, and I think we're, we're in a pretty great place. Mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter is something that Developed and, and I can actually speak to this because I, I I understood it when it when it gained prominence. I understood it when it when when it started when it started, um, and I've come to understand it and embrace it now more than I did years ago. But when when folks say Black Lives Matter, when we say Black Lives Matter, the reason that we're saying this is because once again, if we're starting with this assumption that all lives matter, which we know that. The reason that Black Lives Matter has been said and, and needs to be said is because there are a lot of people who are not working with that assumption. There are a lot of people who do not believe they matter as much. There are, not, there are a lot of people who, who do not see Black life on the same level playing field as white lives or other lives in general. So when people say Black Lives Matter, when we say Black Lives Matter, what we are trying to say is, hey, see us in the same light that you see white lives, Asian lives, Spanish lives, Hispanic lives, whatever. Just see us in the same playing field. Because for too long, those lives have not mattered, right? And the reason we say that is because we look at the disproportional, disproportional way in which black lives are treated, particularly in the States mm -hmm. or around the globe, right? It does not make any sense when you have a smaller section of the population, right? Who are disproportionately represented in prison systems or, or, or 
uh, affected by police brutality. Mm -hmm. Because what you commonly hear is, well, how come we don't talk about how many cases there are uh, against you know, white guys by police? How many cases there are of police brutality against white men? Well, did you know that police actually assaulted X amount of white guys? Yeah, okay, we did know that. But if they're assaulting a higher percentage, yeah. right, everyone gets tripped up in the, in the total number. number about that. Right. Yeah, That's in the total number. If you have 500 white guys assaulted by police and 300 black guys assaulted by police, by the police, then okay, yeah, 500, you know, is a higher number than 300. However, the but population if there are is a million, the if there are a million white guys in your city and 600 black guys, that means... <laughs> about 0.5% of the white guys got assaulted and about 50% of the black guys got assaulted, right? Exactly. And that's the thing that people get tripped up on. Yeah. Right? And the numbers, thinking, we're, it's, it's, it's hyperbolic because the numbers aren't that, aren't that disparate, but they mm -hmm. are disparate. So I, I want to I know what you thought, because I mentioned this last time. You watched the interview with uh, Matthew McConaughey and Emmanuel, what's his last name? Yeah. Blake it. Blake it. Um, gr I thought it was a great interview. So yeah. one of the things that, that was mentioned in that interview I thought was great was right this second, medical professionals are working around the clock to cure what? COVID. Because COVID matters. But does that mean that other infectious diseases matter less? Well, of course not. But it means that what is facing our society right this second is this particular ailment, illness, whatever. And I think, and, and so what he's suggesting is that Black Lives Matter is, is a bit of a bridge into All Lives Matter because right now what's facing our society is that Black Lives don't matter. That, especially in North America, especially different ways in the United States, I get it, but it's like, like that's the thing that we got to put our thumb on right now. Yes. Or we're going to be in trouble in the same way. We got to put our thumb on COVID right now. We got to put our thumb on this, this thing right now, because that's what's right at the forefront. That, and I just, that, that was a helpful analogy for me. I think, I think it's a great analogy. I think, I think it's a timely analogy that everyone can kind of understand right, right. now. Um, and you know, what I've started to see a lot more recently is, all lives don't matter until black lives do. And I think that's another great way of saying it. We're, under, we're, we're operating from this, this, this normal, logical understanding that all lives matter, or they should matter. Mm -hmm. But if black lives aren't mattering, then clearly all lives aren't mattering. So they don't matter until black lives do. We use a COVID example. That's a great one. Uh, as, an, as someone who cares about the environment, I'm going to take this from someone I heard the other day, and I think it's great. We don't say this with any other um, any other cause. It's very interesting if we think about it, and I'd love people to think about this too. There is no cause in the world that we say a counter to. For, for example, everyone has a counter to Black Lives Matter. Well, all lives matter, or white lives matter. No one's saying they don't. But no other cause we do is we don't hear, um, we don't hear someone represent the rainforest and say, you know what? The Amazon rainforest is burning. We need to save the rainforest. Well, what about the rainforest over there? What about other rainforests, right? As someone who loves animals, if, 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 if we were having an issue with, with, with dogs or, 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 or platypus, if we were having like platypus being endangered, and if I had a, a bumper sticker that said, save the platypus, would you come up beside me in the car and say, what about the whales? What about the whales? Right. What about the dolphins? No, because that's insane. That's, well, that's, this, is a, this, is, this is interesting because right, the rainforest example <clears throat> is a good example because right now in Phoenix, there is a wildfire burning uh, near to where Amy's parents live. And it's like the, the Salt River there is a river. Everybody goes tubing and has a great day, whatever. It's closed. It's 0% contained. So if you were to say to me that Amazon rainforest is burning, we need to save the rainforest. And I said, but what about this fire? In Phoenix, it's like, well, I'm not saying that that's not something we should put energy in, you know, I don't know. It, so I, I appreciate that. That's really helpful. Um, so you've been a part of how many protests uh, in the last? I've gone to two protests. I've gone to two protests in the last week. I will be at another one most likely this weekend. Uh, what do you think about the rioting and the looting? So that's a, that's, a, that's a great question about the uh, rioting and looting. And when I think about that, 
I think about the first night that there that that the looting was shown on TV, and it was, you know, it was so just in your face. My first thought <clears throat> was, I'm not for theft. I'm not for looting. I'm not for damaging property. That's my that was my first thought. My first thought was, whoa, whoa, this is not what this is not what we're trying to do here, folks. This is not this is not the way. That was my first thought. Then I think a day or two days later, I started to think about this a little bit more. And I was like, people are upset. What do you, what do you want? People have tried peaceful protesting. Kaepernick tried kneeling. We have tried civil rights. We have tried every single thing. And we hear this all the time. And I say we, I, I talk about the black community. We hear this all the time is go about it this way. Go about it the right way. Well, if you do it like this, we'll listen to you. If you do it like that, we'll listen to you. If you do this, that's probably the better way to, and it keeps changing, yeah. right? I think Trevor Noah said this really well. It, it just keeps changing. These goalposts keep moving. Well, you shouldn't kneel, you should stand. Or you shouldn't do, okay. So I've, if I've exercised every possible option, and you've told me, if you've told me, do it this way, and, and, and you do it, then you're left with no recourse. So I'm not going to be upset when folks riot. I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying that, that I would go out and loot and riot. I, that's, not, that's not me. But I understand when you have been consistently um, beaten, consistently disenfranchised, consistently put in these positions, what, what, what are you going to do? And folks love to, to quote MLK. Well, MLK was peaceful. Oh, for, oh guys, first of all, MLK, like we, we have Disney-fied this, this version of MLK. Right, we've Disneyfied it to a point where it makes people feel comfortable. But MLK was a rattle. MLK, only thing was someone who who said, you know, riots are the language of those without voices, are the language of those who are unheard. Mm -hmm. So I think too often we like to do these things and, and and say these things that make us feel comfortable. But I'm sorry, there is no comfort when you are struggling for equality. There's no comfort when, you know, and it's funny because around the world we we don't discourage unrest when we see when we see people in the middle east fighting for their rights or fighting against a regime or fighting for a revolution whether it's in the middle east whether it's in south america whether it's europe wherever it is africa it doesn't matter wherever it is we understand that if people in north korea started a revolution today it would maybe probably be violent but we would understand it because we'd say they're resisting an oppressive dictatorship I think we have to take a look and understand, wait a second, why is it here when people are resisting yeah, it's an different. oppressive dictatorship? Why is it different? It's different. Mm -hmm. Why is that different? And I so think here's, it. here's um, one of the, so I'm with you. I'm not pro-rioting. I'm not pro-looting, especially like there's some opportunist. I, I don't know what the stat yeah. but it was something like 80% of people <clears throat> are like traveling from one city to another. It's like, hey, I live in Milwaukee, but I'm going to drive to Minneapolis because there's looting there and I can get a free TV. Like, I think that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's um, nonsense. And, and, and I think in those people, they've really done violence to the Black Lives Matter movement in a lot of ways because they've hijacked it and yes. commandeered it for their own personal gain. Um, but so I'm not pro rioting, I'm not pro looting. However, what if we looked at it as symptomatic? The minute that someone begins to burn down a black owned property in order to demonstrate how oppressed they feel and how oppressed they are, they have really gone a long way towards communicating their message. So um, the example would be this. Uh, do you remember the guy who was hiking and he got his arm caught but between a boulder and the of course. wall? And what did he do? You remember? He had to cut his arm off with a, with a arm pocket off. knife, with a pocket knife. Now, is that a healthy, helpful, constructive thing to do? Of course not. But he felt so incredibly stuck and he had tried every other way out. The first thought is not, I'll cut my arm off. That's how I'll get out. The first thought is wiggled. I mean, he was there for like 24 hours or something like that. So in this particular case, I look at it as almost akin to that. It's like people have felt so incredibly stuck right in this in bound up that that when that kind of violence or cutting one's own arm off or whatever erupts from underneath that 
Like I would say, that's not good. That's, that's not healthy and constructive. But at the same time I say, but I get it, but I get yeah. it. I get where that's coming from. Cause you felt so stuck. Yeah. I think that's a great example. I think it's a great comparison. Um, and I think, you know, you think about every argument or fight that you have <clears throat> with your partner or whomever, if you come running into the house and you're just screaming like a mad person yelling, that's not constructive. And that's probably not the best way to communicate how you feel. Mm-hmm. Right. There, 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 there are levels and there are steps. And I, I love to use like, you know, colors. I love to use like green, yellow, orange, yeah. red. Yeah. And I always yeah. talk about this with, with my teams or friends or whatever. I'm like, if you jump in at red, that's a problem. You really should not <laughs> right. be starting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right, red. All right, that should never really be the case. But if you try going through every channel and your voice isn't being heard, and, and not only is your voice not being heard, it's being dismissed, or at best, but at worst, it's Silence. being oppressed. It's Actively being suppressed. Silent. Yeah. It's being active. That, and that's where I think we have the thing is like, there's a different story. If you and I have an argument or disagreement, I should not be coming at red yelling at you. Right? We should be going through things. And sometimes it might get heated and then eventually we get to red. Okay, that's mm-hmm. fine. That's a different story. But it's different if I'm trying, if you're, if, you, if I was to be talking to you now and you muted me. And you muted me. Right? And yeah, I'm so texting like, you. I'm like, I hey, love, unmute me. Yeah, I love that analogy because, again, let's say you and I were having a disagreement. And because of the disagreement, you laid your hands on me and got physical with me. 99% of the people in the world would say, that's not all right. That's not all right. But if we were having a disagreement and I quite literally put my hand over your mouth like that and clamped it, and then you laid hands on me in order to get me off, 99% of the people in the world would go, well, you put your hand on his mouth, dude. What do you expect him to do? And I think, <clears throat> I think as a society, we have to look at what's happening and go, how bad does it have to get that you've tried green, yellow, orange, and now we're at red? It's pretty bad, right? We have gone above and beyond here. Um, and, and in order to cut your own arm off, it's got to get pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, I talked about this on the show um, the other day, and I said, uh, Actually, it hasn't come out yet. It'll come out this week. But I said, you look even protests. We are in a global pandemic. We're in a global pandemic. And folks are outside protesting in close proximity. But risk, putting yeah. themselves at risk. So here's another great example. Do you know how serious you have to feel in your belief that you are risking? I'm out there protesting. Mm-hmm. I'm, putting, I'm putting myself at risk. And some of these people are not wearing masks. I'm wearing a mask. Mm-hmm. But, I'm, but I firmly believe in it. So let's ask ourselves, before we dismiss anything, we should say, and this is black and white. It's not just black people. There's a lot of white people out marching. There's everyone mm-hmm. marching. Mm-hmm. So how, how far have we gone? How f- we've gone too far where everyone's like, you know what? I'm going to risk exposure to COVID. I'm going to risk exposure to a virus to which there is no cure and no vaccine right now because I believe in this so much because things are too messed up. Yeah. So... I have two more questions and then we can be done. Before uh, you hop on your next question, I'll say this, because I wanted to say this earlier when we were talking about perspective and we were talking about, you know, as a white individual or as white groups, you know, thinking like not letting shame and guilt, because I think those are paralyzing things, mm-hmm. right? I'd rather, I'd rather awareness and I'd rather, uh, you know, just a, a second thought, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but that also goes for the black community. That also goes for us is how often times do we make assumptions? And I, I said this in another piece the other day. I was like, how often times do we look and say, well, I don't see myself in that space. Or, you know what, they're white, so they're not, so they're gonna be racist, or they're not going to have my back. I think everyone needs to maybe just have a second thought rather than leading with, with the assumption. Because we all, what I'm really getting is we all have work to do. I think we all have work to do. And whenever you lead with an assumption, whether that's, oh, he must have played football, or, oh, she's going to be aggressive, or, oh, he's going to be a stuffy white guy who can't dance, chances are he may not be able to dance. 
but the point is, let, there you go. <laughs> but I think we, I think we all have to be careful with leading with, with, with these assumptions um, because then that, that, that it separates us. And what I've come to think is more often than not, we have a lot more in common. We have a lot more in common than we do uh, not. Uh, and that goes for both. Yeah. Uh, so I'm glad that you kind of popped in and said that because it does, it's a nice little segue into my next question. And, and the question is, what can I do uh, as a pastor, as a dad, as a human being, whatever? And then what can others do, regardless of age, ability level, skin color, gender, to help? to come alongside, to support. And I think it just goes to the question that I was asked on Facebook Live last night. What can we do to help and support our black brothers and sisters? Because so many of us, and there were people on that call last night from Arizona. There were people on that call last night that are brown. There are people on that call that are black and white and Asian. And all of us are going, we're here to help. And one of the things that you just said, and I think it, one, it's like, just raise awareness, right? Learn, grow, ask questions. Um, second guess your assumptions, you know, so that's a good one. What else can we do to help? I think what, <clears throat> so it's a two part question. I think what those who aren't black can do to help in this moment, I'm going to rephrase that, not this moment from now forward, because it's not a moment. This is, this is, a, this is a movement towards change. This is a lifestyle change. You can't just go to the gym for a week and say, oh, I'm gonna get shredded in a week and I, don't, I, can, I can now eat whatever, and next week I'm not. That's not the way change happens. If you need to see change, you need to constantly, consistently build toward it. It's a marathon, not a sprint. For those who aren't black, what I would say right now is, yeah, I think second guess your assumptions. I think, I think learn. The first thing that comes to mind, and I have this conversation all the time, is if you, as, as, a, as the black community, we have to know what it's like to live in a world that doesn't look like us, where our images are constantly, like the media is constantly uh, white, our government constantly looks white, just images are white everywhere. Mm -hmm. We have to know what it's like to operate in a white world, then we also have to know what it's like to operate in a black world. Mm -hmm. So we, we're doing both. And when you're white, you don't have to think about that. You don't have to think, what's it like to be black? What's it like to, 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 to go to a black, you know, an all black this, or, you know, what, you, don't, you don't have to think about these things. And I think that is a place where we can start from, is putting ourselves in, in another world, because we've been doing that for a long time. The black community, we, we, we know what it's like to go to work and it's all white people. We know what it's like to maybe go to a party and all white people or, 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 or white friends or be the minority. So when you're used to privilege, equality can sometimes feel like oppression. It's not, right? It's just, hey, maybe let me think about it from another perspective. Maybe just look around. All right, oh, wait, 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 back that, back that truck up real quick. When you're used to privilege, equality can sometimes feel like oppression. Yeah. That's... Yeah. That's awesome. That's radical. That's good. That'll preach. But I think that's where we're, one of the reasons we're in the problem we're in yeah. is because if you have, like, if I have a whole pie and, you know, someone's like, hey, dude, you kind of got too much of the pie. You kind of want to maybe, maybe divvy it up a little bit, mm. right? If I'm greedy, I'm going to say, no, no, this is mine. Yeah. I have it. But if I'm fair, I'm going to say, oh, you know what? Shoot. Maybe I do have a little too much of this pie. Yeah. I don't if need all this dinner. If you're, if you're used to eating 70% of the pie every time you sit down to eat pie, and then someone tells you, but there's four people here, so we're going to divvy it up in quarters, you go, well, I've gone from 70 to 25%, but equality is going to feel like oppression because you're only because you're used to privilege, right? Because you're used to privilege. So I, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because every question I have, you have teed me up. Uh, absolutely perfect segue every time without knowing the question. So um, uh, we talk about being black and living in a white world. The very first time I, and, and, and my experiences of being the visible minority in a space are 
few and far between for 41 years of life. But I remember um, several years ago, Amy is the godmother for um, a little- You look 35, man. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, you look good. Not a day over 35. Um, so Amy is a godmother for uh, a, a little girl in our life group, um, black family. And they had like a, a after church, you know, um, deal when she was dedicated and whatever. And there were 70 people at their house or something like that. And Amy and I were the only two white people in the room. Yeah. And uh, now that is perhaps the most benign and safe space you could possibly be in. You're at a child's dedication at like a, at like an after church brunch. I mean, for crying out loud, like how much safer can you get? And yet, and yet I recognized it right away. I recognized it right away. And that I was the visible minority. That's not good, bad, or it's just neutral. It's just, it just is, it's a thing. And so in your space, you're, you're going into spaces that aren't that benign and safe as the visible minority. And I'm thinking, holy cats. So the reason I share that is because, um, are you familiar with W.E.B. Du Bois? Of course. There you go. Uh, wrote a book called The Souls of Black Folk about 100 years mm -hmm. ago. Um, th some of the language is antiquated. So I'm going to read a quote from here, and you'll know what language is antiquated here. But just give me grace and give Du Bois grace. Of course. Um, I, I wouldn't actually, I, I've recommended all kinds of things. I've recommended American Sun as intense as it is. I don't think that's something you watch with your four-year-old, but you know, um, I've recommended the 13th. I've recommended um, some other stuff, but I would recommend that book, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, Souls of Black Folk. I read it in university and that, I think I look back at when I started to kind of like, oh man, maybe the world is not the same for everybody. Um, and W.E.B. Du Bois talks about as a black man living in the United States, living from behind a veil in that book. And I was, I was uh, reading just a few things in my copy, actually, that I've highlighted a bunch of stuff and whatever sitting on my shelf uh, last night. And here's the quote, and, and I, I just want you to respond to this quote, and this will be the last thing, and then you can go about your, your day. Du Bois says this, one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, Two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. I just wanted to hear a response. I think that that is, um, that is the constant state that, uh, that, that, Blacks in America, Canada, around the world feel is because you're constantly you're constantly dealing with what it's like to be black and what that means in terms of when you step outside your house, you have to think about how am I going to be treated as a black person? Um, uh, how am I going to get this job? Am I not going to get this job? Am I going to be assaulted? You know, I have to think about that. And then you also have to think about just normal human stuff that we all think about. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I know that, I know that in that work, he talks about this and I think he, he makes it really succinct and really perfect. And I think that's the thing that we all have to kind of understand. And I think it's a great way to end because to my white brothers and sisters, I would ask how many times when you leave the house, do you think about the fact that you're white? How many times do you think about that? Because I can, zero. I can guarantee you, I have never stepped outside of my house and, it's, and not thought about the fact that I'm black. I have to think about that, and then I have to think about everything else too. Both of those things that I have to work with, and, and people like me have to work with. So when we talk about being aware, and we talk about privilege, it's, Every, everyone faces hardship, I think, regardless of race, color, everyone faces hardship. You know, you might grow up in an alcoholic family, abusive family, great family, well, it doesn't matter. But everyone faces hardship. The question that I think we need to start asking is, how many of those hardships were because of your skin color? 
And that, that's the question. Yeah. And what can we do to kind of start removing that as being a reason for the hardship? Thanks, man. You're awesome. Of course. I have my moments. <laughs> I have my moments. Easy when I got a good, uh, a good friend to do this with. So yeah. thanks, for, thanks for this. This is great. Yeah, man. Happy to.